Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. What a blessing it is to be able to join together again in worship of our great and almighty God. A couple of announcements on behalf of our consistory. There'll be morning coffee next Sunday, the 19th, after the morning service. You're reminded the Bible study commences this week on Tuesday night at 8 p.m. with a presentation by Reverend Anson on mission in our own backyard. Catechism is due to begin this week as well, but stay tuned to the church social for further details. And there'll be a door collection held on the 26th of February after the morning service for the Turkish and Syrian relief aid. The collections this afternoon will be collected for the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary. So far, announcements. If you're able to, please rise. God greets us with these words, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's respond to God's greeting by singing together from Psalm 71, verses 1 and 3. This afternoon we grapple with the question, what is true faith? And so begin our annual study of the Apostles' Creed, which is a summary of all that is promised in the Gospel, a profession of our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith. I'll now read our profession with you and I encourage you to say it along with me silently in your heart and may God, God cause us to live out this profession every day of our lives. And with the Church of All Ages, we confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Christian church. 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Let's join together in praising this God of whom we've just professed by singing from Psalm 131, verses 1, 2 and 3. Let's unite in prayer. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord of lords, King of kings, how great you are. Holy, holy, holy. How marvellous it is that the creator and ruler of all things visible and invisible allows us, sinful creatures, to come into your throne room in prayer. Almighty God, as you sit on your heavenly throne and look down at us on earth, you must see us like tiny ants bustling here and there, billions of us wandering around on the surface of this earth, but gracious God, you do not stay far off, observing from a distance. Yes, you rule from on high, but you also rule us from within. You did not stay far off when man in his sinful rebellion rejected you and trusted in his own wisdom, in his own strength. You, in your amazing grace, have always come near to your people and nurtured us, guided us, and taught us your ways. We've seen your love for your people throughout history, culminating in the gift of your son who lived in perfect obedience to you and was willing to bear your wrath against sin, your wrath that we deserved. He took upon himself so that we might be able to live in your holy presence once again. And here we are again today, gathered in your presence. Lord, what a blessing that is. Just as you have cared for us in the physical realm by showering us with rain and causing the sun to shine, both essential ingredients for growth, so it is in the spiritual realm where your sun's face shines on us and you shower us with your word so that we might grow in our faith and grow closer to you. O oh Lord, how we love to be in your presence, for we know this is the best place for us. Here we get to experience a foretaste of eternal life with you, 
where we as a great multitude of believers can hear you speak to us and we can speak to you and we can worship you. Oh, how beautiful that will be. And we long for you to come in glory. Until that time comes, we cherish what you've given us here on earth, a community of believers here in Lagana to love, to be loved, to walk alongside us to, as we seek to serve you as your faithful children. A loving God and faithful Saviour, as we open your word this afternoon, help us to know you more, to trust you more, to share you more, and to live in the joy of salvation. Bless your word unto us, and may your great wisdom we adore and trust in you now and evermore. In Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. This afternoon the text for our sermon will be Lord's Day 7 and in connection with that we're going to read two portions of scripture, one from John and one from Romans. The one from John 3 highlights how we're not saved because of our family name or our lineage or our obedience to the law and Romans 11 highlights that we are saved indeed by God's free grace and favour through faith. So let's turn first of all to John chapter 3. We'll read the verses 1 to 21. And then we'll turn to Romans 11. John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi... We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So far our passage from John. Let's now turn to Romans chapter 11. And we'll read there from verses 11 
through to 36. The theme for the sermon is the Holy Spirit grafts us into Christ by a true faith. And you see reference to that grafting in this passage. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back in to their own olive tree. Lest you be wise in your own sight, who do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So far our reading from scripture, as I mentioned, our text is Lord, Lord's Day 7, so we'll read that together now. Lord's Day 7, you'll find on page 523 of our church psalm books. And 
And there the question is asked, are all men then saved by Christ just as they perished through Adam? No. Only those are saved who by a true faith are grafted into Christ and accept all his benefits. What is true faith? True faith is a sure knowledge whereby I accept as true all that God has revealed to us in his word. At the same time, it is a firm confidence that not only to others, but also to me, God has granted forgiveness of sins, everlasting righteousness and salvation out of mere grace, only for the sake of Christ's merits. This faith, the Holy Spirit, works in my heart by the gospel. What then must a Christian believe? All that is promised us in the gospel which the articles of our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith teach us in a summary. And question 23 asks, what are these articles? And they are those which we professed at the beginning of this service, the Apostles' Creed. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, I preach to you the gospel of salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone, under the following theme. The Holy Spirit grafts us into Christ by a true faith. We'll see two points this afternoon. That true faith consists of an assured knowledge and a knowing assurance. As we have proceeded through our study of the Heidelberg Catechism, we've been following a clear line of thought, a line of thought that comes from the scriptures itself. The comfort that we have in life and in death is that we belong to our faithful saviour, Jesus Christ, who has fully paid for all our sins with his precious blood and has set us free from the power of the devil. This is not just a great comfort, it's also a great miracle. For as we learn further in Lord's Day 2, to live before the face of God, we need to be perfectly holy, just as God is holy. However, the more we learn about what it means to be holy, to live in perfect obedience before God, the more we realise how far we fall short in doing this, and that it's beyond our strength and capability to ever be holy in and of ourselves. And therefore, but for the grace of God, we would have perished eternally, along with the rest of the human race. And that eternal judgment would have been just. But the gospel, the good news, is that God sent us his son so that in him we might have life. But now comes Lord's Day 7. Are all men then saved by Christ just as they perished through Adam? Who gets to be saved in Christ? Everybody? When we read this question today, we read it in the context of a heresy called universalism. Universalism is a false teaching that is promoted by many people, a recent one being Rob Bell, in a popular book called Love Universalism teaches that at the end of time, everyone will be saved. Hell will be empty and heaven will be full. For they say God is a God of love. And how could a God of love send anyone to the eternal fires of hell? And so universalists teach that there's no such thing as hell, that we're all going to enjoy the pleasures of heaven. Others are not quite so positive, but still believe that most people will be going to heaven. It'll only be the worst criminals, the vile of the vile, who will be in hell. But the rest of us who try to live a good life, whether we be Jews, Christians, Muslims, New Age or a blend of everything, can most certainly look forward to whatever heaven there is to look forward to when we die. Lord's Day 7 
gives a strong biblical response to the heresy of universalism when it answers the question of whether or not all men will be saved in Christ just as they perished through Adam. It answers with a resounding no. The idea that all people, or even most people, will be saved is simply not true. Matthew 7 verse 13 and 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. But at the time that the Catechism was written, the answer no to the question of whether or not all men are saved by Christ would not have been a new or even a very controversial answer. Almost everybody believed in the final day of judgment, that there is both a heaven and a hell. And the fact that salvation in Christ is not for all. But what was not commonly understood, however, was how one could actually be joined to Jesus Christ how he could be saved. In the 1500s, the Roman Catholic Church did not emphasise personal faith, but rather the faith of the church. You are saved, they said, by being a member of the church. It was not necessary for individuals to read the Bible for themselves, to study it and to learn what God's word has to say. In fact, to read and study the Bible for yourself was forbidden. It was the church's job, they said, to know what God's will is. And a person was saved by simply agreeing to the faith of the church. So the way to be saved, the Roman Catholics taught, was to be baptised, take the mass, submit to the authority of the church and then do the good works that the church demanded. It would appear that Nicodemus had similar views when in John chapter 3 he came to Jesus at night. Nicodemus, who himself was a teacher of the law, did not understand how one was saved. And so when Jesus told him that unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, he was confused. For Nicodemus, one was saved by being a child of Abraham and then keeping the law in the manner explained by the religious leaders. But our Lord explained to Nicodemus that actually, this was not the way to salvation that the way to salvation was completely different. To be saved, one must be born again, which was a work of the Holy Spirit. And being born again, it is through faith that one is saved. And more specifically, it is through faith in God's only begotten Son, the one who came to be lifted up on the cross, that one received salvation. That is the way that you'll be joined to Christ and receive the benefits that he came to bring. And so the Catechism refutes the teaching of Rome and reflects the truth of Scripture when it says that to be saved by Christ, you need to be joined to him, like a branch is joined to the trunk of a tree. The Bible teaches this in John 15, verse 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. But as the Catechism also teaches us, we are not naturally a part of the vine, for by nature we were children of wrath. And so we need to be grafted into Christ to be a part of him and enjoy the privileges he came to bring. And the word grafting is a very good one to describe how we are joined to Christ. The process of grafting involves taking the branch of one tree and binding it to another tree so that it grows to become a part of that new tree. And that is what happened to us. We were by nature children of wrath, but we were taken and then, through the work of the Holy Spirit, joined to Christ. This is explained further in Romans 11. There it says, The Apostle Paul 
was explaining how the new covenant community is now made up more of Gentiles than of Jews, and that being joined to Christ is something to be thankful for, not proud. Paul describes the covenant community as an olive tree, with Christ being its root, from which the fatness, the riches, the life of the tree was found. But he explained that some of the natural branches, that is the covenant children of Israel, were broken off. And then we, who were wild olive branches, we were grafted in. And being grafted into the olive tree, who is Christ, is not our work, but a gift of God. As the first part of Romans 11:24 says, for you were cut out of the old olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. And it's not because of you or what you did or because of you being such a good branch that you were grafted into the olive tree, into Christ. In fact, it was not even your own doing. Just as the branch of one tree cannot decide to leave that tree and join another one, so we could never be grafted into Christ, joined to him by our own works or our own decision. We are joined to Christ by the grace of God, through the working of the Holy Spirit. But there is more to be said about how we are joined to Christ. The Bible teaches us that we are joined to him by faith. It is by faith that we are joined to Christ and it is by unbelief that others are cut off from him and stand condemned. Romans 11, 19 and 20 says, You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off and you stand by faith. And that's what Christ also explained to Nicodemus in John 3. When Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, our Lord said to him that the only way to enter the kingdom of heaven, the only way to be saved is to be born again. Being born again is the work of the Holy Spirit, something that in itself we cannot fully comprehend. But when Nicodemus asked our Lord how these things can be, Christ spoke about the need for faith, for personal faith. Faith in the Son of Man. The one who would be lifted up, just as the snake was lifted up in the wilderness. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The Catechism is right when it asks and answers, are all men then saved through Christ just as they perished through Adam? No, only those are saved who by a true faith are grafted into Christ and accept all his benefits. So to be saved, one needs to have faith. And that faith must be personal. And that faith must have a specific content. It is a faith in something, or more correctly, in someone. In his Institutes, John Calvin spoke strongly against the Roman Catholic teaching that the laity, the common church member, could remain ignorant and be saved simply by being a member of the Roman church. In book 3, chapter 2, he explained that faith rests upon God's word. To show that faith and teaching go together, he quoted from Ephesians 4, verses 20 and 21. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. And John 20, verse 21, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing... You may have life in his name. And Romans 10 verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. True faith, therefore, has a specific content 
And the content is the Holy Gospel, which as confessed in Lord's Day 6 is found in the entire Bible. And as it says in answer 21, true faith is a sure knowledge whereby I accept as true all that God has revealed to us in his word. So in order to be grafted into Christ and accept all his benefits, we need a true faith. And in order to have such a faith, we need to have an assured knowledge where we both know and accept as true all that God has revealed to us in his word. So in the first place, we need to know what God has revealed. We need to come to church, hear the preaching of the gospel and then work with the preaching, reading the Bible further for ourselves, studying it, that we might know and understand it more and more. And then, as the Holy Spirit works faithfully our hearts by the gospel that is preached we will be assured that the word of God is true and trustworthy true faith is an assured knowledge but to be an assured knowledge true faith must also be a complete well-rounded knowledge answer 22 goes on to teach what a Christian must believe all that is promised in the gospel which the articles of our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith teach us in a summary. A true faith is a personal faith for each of us personally must listen, learn and believe. But it's not an individualistic faith. It is a Catholic, universal faith for it is a faith in the firm and unchanging word of God. And so together with the Church of All Ages, we confess in summary what this faith consists of in the Apostles' Creed. This creed was not written by the Apostles, nor was it written by a single person or at a particular time in church history. The Apostles' Creed began as a brief summary to teach people the basic truths of the Gospel before they were baptised and became members of the Church. Over time, this creed grew and developed. There was the king and Christian leader Charlemagne of what is now known as France, who in 813 AD made the Apostles' Creed as we have it today, the standard creed of his kingdom. From there, the Christian church adopted it as the Catholic or universal summary of the Christian faith. And so we still hold on to it today. The Apostles' Creed is a summary of the Gospel, the Word of God. And what we confess in this creed is then explained in Lord's Days 8 to 22. It's good for us to learn from this every year again. Because for our faith to be a true faith, it must have a specific content. It must believe in the full Word of God. And as we learn from the Gospel, we must pray that the Holy Spirit will bless us with what we learn so that we may be assured that what we learn in the gospel is true and that what is promised is also for us. The Catechism's definition of true faith teaches that it is more than an assured knowledge. True faith also consists of a knowing assurance, which is our second point. From the Catechism we read, At the same time, it is a firm confidence that not only to others, but also to me, God has granted forgiveness of sins, everlasting righteousness and salvation out of mere grace, only for the sake of Christ's merits. This assurance of faith was already expressed in answer one of the catechism. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life. Such assurance gives us peace and confidence for the present and the future. It was the assurance of faith that enabled David to sing in Psalm 46 verse 1 and 2, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. 
And also Psalm 3 verse 5. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. True faith gives us that assurance, that deep-seated, heartfelt confidence of the love and protection of God, of his salvation. That doesn't mean, however, that David or we have perfect faith, nor that we always enjoy such confident assurance. The same David who wrote Psalm 3 and 46 also wrote Psalm 42 verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? And Psalm 31 verse 22. I said in my haste, I am cut off from before your eyes. That is before God's eyes. It's not as though David's faith was always strong and solid as a rock. And if David, a man after God's own heart, struggled with such doubts, it should not surprise us that even the most godly may at times find his faith sorely tested by waves of doubt. Our Canons of Dort acknowledges this in chapter 5, article 11. Scripture, meanwhile, testifies that believers in this life have to struggle with various doubts of the flesh and placed under severe temptation do not always feel this assurance of faith and certainty of perseverance. And in the form for the celebration of the Lord's Supper, we confess we do not have perfect faith and we do not serve God with such zeal as he requires. Daily we have to contend with the weakness of our faith and with the evil desires of our flesh. But here too we see the grace of God, a grace that directs us away from our weakness and back to God's trustworthiness. For as we confess in Lord's Day 23 of the Catechism, not that I am acceptable to God on account of the worthiness of my faith, for only the satisfaction, righteousness and holiness of Christ is my righteousness before God. It's not faith that makes us acceptable to God, but what Christ has done. And so God looks upon us in his grace and mercy when we cry out to him, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. And so even as we experience struggles in the flesh and doubts arise in our hearts, we may be encouraged by the words of Psalm 27 verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And the blessing of the hope of faith is that those who wait on the Lord are never put to shame. Those who wait on the Lord do have their strength renewed like that of eagles. The assurance of faith is restored and strengthened. For when the doubts of faith arise, we do not look inside ourselves, but we look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Faith is not trust in ourselves, that we think we are strong enough to hold on to God. But faith is trust in God, that he who created and redeemed us is always true to his word and that he will never let us go. But such faith is a knowing assurance. Such conviction of faith is not based on mere feelings, but it is based on the truth of promises of the gospel, the truth of God's word. This faith the Holy Spirit works in my heart by the gospel. And so let us turn and return to the gospel. Let us turn and return to the word of God, to the preaching, to the reading and study of it. Come to church regularly, every Sunday, morning and afternoon. Read the word, the Bible. Talk about it and study it. And above all, pray to the Lord for his grace and the Holy Spirit, that he might work and strengthen that true faith in your hearts. Set your heart on Jesus Christ. Look to him. Remember that God has made him our wisdom, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And then you will enjoy the assurance that comes 
from a true faith in him. Amen. In response to God's word for us this afternoon, let us join in praise once again. We'll sing from Psalm 62, verses 1, 3 and 4. Psalm 62, verses 1, 3 and 4. now have opportunity to give to the Lord from the blessings that he has given to us and this afternoon they'll be collected for the Canadian Reform Theological Seminary and after the collection let's sing together from Psalm 40 verse 4.
Let's unite again in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we praise you for your abundant goodness. Not only did you create mankind to live in relationship with you, providing everything needed in body and soul, but when we rejected you, you held on to your people. You instructed us, you disciplined us, and you draw us back to you through faith in Jesus Christ. You did all this, and how grateful we are. Thank you for your steadfast love and faithfulness, and for making yourself known to us in your word and in creation. And thank you that we not only know about you, but through the work of your spirit we may believe in you and trust in you completely for all we need in body, but more importantly, for all we need in our soul. Work in us mightily, Lord, that we may live out of our assured knowledge and our knowing assurance, being confident and courageous to shine in this dark world and to share your good news. Lord, we pray for your blessing on our collection this afternoon, our offering of thanksgiving. We've collected for the work of the Reformed Theological College in Canada. Lord, we thank you for the college and for their work in training people to be able to confidently and courageously teach your word to people all across the globe. We pray that you continue to bless all the staff, the professors and administrators and volunteers, that you give them wisdom and passion for their task. We pray that you equip the students with diligence and an unquenchable thirst to know you more deeply. We pray that your people will be richly blessed and soundly taught by the graduates whether in church congregations or on the mission field. Equip your servants with all they need. We also thank you for our pastor, Lord, a recent graduate of the Theological College. We thank you that you've guided Anson, Rachel, Kaya and Joash throughout Anson's time of study. Not only have you been teaching Anson You've been teaching Rachel and the children what it means to be a pastor's family. And the family has been through a season of change. The completion of study, the consideration of call, the preparations to move and the saying of goodbyes, then hellos, the settling in and the starting of school. Lord, how this past season has had its challenges. And in your love, you've guided them through it. We pray that you'll bless the family now with a period of calm, of settling in and of finding their place, a time of being embraced and nurtured and loved. And whatever your will for the Van Delden family in the next little while, Lord, may they feel one with us. Father, we pray for Anton as our pastor. As he tries to make sense of his role, give him clarity and give him confidence and give Rachel all she needs to support him, but also to work alongside him, as indeed she is doing. 
and give the children, Kaya and Joash, pride in what their dad does and help them to support him in his important role but still see him and love him as dad. Guide us as congregation, Lord, as we work with Anson under his leadership and that of the consistory. Yes, they are but sinful men, but they are called and equipped to special office and we pray you give them what they need, but also give us what we need. Make us humble, make us passionate, make us delight in your word and be diligent in it and make us discerning. As much as we pray that our pastor and his family be a blessing to us, we pray that we may be an abundant blessing to them. Be especially at this time with Kaya and Joash as they settle into a new school, with new relationships and new routines. Help them to feel at home and to feel loved. And we also pray that Kaya's arm will heal soon and that she'll be able to use it at its full strength. Lord, we also give you thanks that this morning amongst us in church we could see Lorena's dad, Shane. Lord, we've heard of the horrific injuries he suffered in an accident last year and to see him mobile, to see him free of the lim- some of the limitations that he's had over a period of time, Lord, we praise your goodness to Shane and to the family. We thank you that he could be here with us this morning and we pray that you continue to bless Nigel and Lorena as they witness in his life. Lord, we ask that we may all be at full strength for the week ahead, not physically and mentally so much, for we know the weakness of our flesh, but strong spiritually. Lord, make us busy in your word, busy in prayer, and busy in praise. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us sing praises to our great God once more this afternoon with hymn 71.
As we lift up our hearts to the Lord, he sends us on our way with these words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.